This week's episode is in partnership with Intact Insurance, here for you and for everything you care about. Everybody clap. Woo! Well, hello, everybody. I'm Jan Arden. This is the Jan Arden Podcast. I'm sitting here with Caitlin Green in the studio. She's clapping. <laughs> really? Almost in time. Almost in time. Yeah. I do my best. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? I miss you. A week goes by. I know. I haven't really talked to you. You don't yeah. really email me or text me. <laughs> I text you sometimes. Because I know you have a, a life going on. <laughs> I, I live in a state of sleep deprivation. Do you? I do. I really do. Well, purposely? No. I mean, I know you no. work on a morning Pur- show. That's right. So that's not a good way to be. Mm-mm, no. They say you. It, it literally cuts years off your life to not sleep. They're saying now seven hours. Mm-hmm. I prefer nine. Oh. What am I going to do anyway from 8 o'clock till 5.30, 6 a.m.? I'm not going to do anything. I'm right there with you. I like, would live like a house cat if I could. But you are you are still young enough in yeah. your th- mid to late 30s. Yep. I was still like just drinking crazy, going to bed <laughs> late. Like, not looking after myself, not eating properly, but you still have time to club, so you don't want to club no more. Not really. I have the occasional big weekend, and if I go to, like, the occasional concert or show with my friends, yes. then, I, then I'll push it. Like, if it's worth it, I'll still push it. But my hours have beaten me into submission. When you wake up at 4.30 in the morning, five days a week, oof, nothing. there's nothing I want more the second that the weekend comes than my own bed. I just want my own bed. But I bet you don't sleep in. I, well, so that's the thing. Sleeping in for me really it's is... six o'clock. I actually get up at nine on weekends. Oh, good for you. Yeah. So when I'm left to my own devices, I'll probably get up and around at nine o'clock. I'll wake up at six and then I force myself to go back to sleep. And that's my best sleep. <sighs> that three hours after I've woken up and insisted I go back to bed. Do you have to pee at any point yes, in the Yes, always. Evening? I always have to okay, pee. Okay. I just thought that was an older person <laughs> thing, but I'm glad to hear that someone in their mid to late 30s, Mm -hmm. uh, does have to get up. And I love that when you get up to pee, and everyone can relate to this, and try and stay asleep. Oh. So that you're not, Adam is nodding in the Our producer Adam is nodding along. Yeah. So when you try and stay asleep, when you go in to pee, like sometimes it is, you're right, you go do that, it's 4.30, it's Mm -hmm. 3.30, and you sink back into this wonderful sleep it's the best but you cannot play a game of chicken with your bladder because no. it will always win it's not good for you anyway no it's, it it's not good for you as you get older you can't screw around don't hold your pee <laughs> that is our gonna be our running theme no it's not our theme for well, the show the tricky part is though that i find i get i'm really i get thirsty later in the day and it's the time when I should be winding down my water consumption if I don't want to wake up twice a night. And so I always catch myself having like a big glass of water before bed. And I think, really what am good I for? doing? You know what? I would opt for that anytime. Yeah. What it does for your body. I'm no scientist, Caitlin. <laughs> I don't know if I told you. Dr. Jan. But I always have a glass of water yeah. by my nightstand. I think if you feel thirsty, you're already too late. Mm-hmm. And this is what they always say. Ath- trainers always say that if you're thirsty, you're dehydrated at that point, that you should never be thirsty, that you should be drinking water when you're not thirsty. So at night, I, I usually always take a few sips. If I'm reading, I'll have, I don't know, it's not eight ounces of water, mm-hmm. but I'm either doing that or I'm sipping a chamomile tea. Okay. What is your before bed routine and okay. what is on your bedside table? Because I am so fascinated by everyone's bedtime routines as a morning show person. Okay, I have a lamp from my mother okay. that is uh, pinky and blue boy are on either side of my bed. Oh, okay. Giant. Giant lamps. Giant lamps of pinky and blue boy. Google it if you don't know what that is. If you don't know what it is, you're probably Caitlin's age. <laughs> but you might know what that is, don't you? I'm going to Google it right now. Okay. okay. So there's that. I have, um, I have, <laughs> I have one of those rollers that my assistant Nadine bought me. Um, it's the little jade roller, the The facial roller, the facial roller. I do it all the time on my neck and on my jawline. And I don't think anything will ever happen, but in my mind, I'm, I'm counting on the power of positive thinking just to get rid of some of my chins. And I, I feel like, (laughs) no, I feel like it's, it's going to work. So I have that. I always have got three or four books on the go. Presently, mm-hmm. I'm reading The Japanese Lover, which is amazing. Oh. Very. It's one of those stories that goes back and forth in time. I have Vicks Vapor Rub <gasps> in the drawer. So do I. In my drawer. 
because my dad did it all the time. I love it. Okay, and it's just there. And sometimes I'm like, I think I need a little minty freshness, eucalyptus mm-hmm. going through my nasal passages. So it's I'm, relaxing. Yes. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Really, because Caitlin, you've made me feel so good. I find that it make it there. I feel like this is the Masters and Johnson sex study where I found <laughs> out that you've done some weird thing that I do too. <laughs> I I love it because it creates this feeling of like freshness and cleanness, and I just I like it. The smell is very therapeutic, and so I and I love Vicks Vapor. So it's right there. And I bet your husband's all over you oh, when yeah. you do that. So hot. He's like, move, eucalyptus, <laughs> menthol. Okay, so you've got that in the drawer. And yes, and, and always books on the go. Mm-hmm. And I have um, a little button that's kind of sitting in Blue Boy's arms. And it's of my mom and dad at the Calgary Stampede in 1957. Aww. And they must have got buttons punched and like their little pictures made into buttons. That must have been the big thing. Mm-hmm. I have that and I have a, a tourmaline rock. That's oh. sitting there. And usually a hair elastic. Usually, That's it. Always a hair elastic. They're always floating around. Yeah. I, I usually roll over on toe and wake up with it on my face. I'm like, yeah. oh, where'd that come from? No, I, you always have to have that. Because I cannot read with my hair down. It yeah. drives me nuts to have hair on my neck. Yes. Thank Caitlin. It's true. Don't make me burst into tears. <laughs> because I feel like... Do you feel you seen? Have, yeah, I feel seen. <laughs> Okay, so we know what's on your bedside table. What's tables. on your bedside table? So, okay, I have uh, the Vicks paper up in the drawer. I always have hand cream, thick hand cream. I always have now a new addition to my bedside if table. You just joined. You just joined us. <laughs> so, thick hand cream, a lip mask. So this is something hmm. I've noticed that I think that it really helps with my, you know, lip mask. we live in the driest nation in the world. But what does that even mean? So it's like a thicker lip balm oh, and you okay. leave it on overnight. I was picturing, you know, coronavirus masks <laughs> going over your face. It's not the N95 mask. Okay. No, it's it's uh, it's berry scented. It's very um, moisturizing. It's very hydrating. Okay. And so I don't wake up with with dry lips or anything. Okay. Um, so I, I have a lip mask. I have my hand cream. I have my water. I have eye drops. And I'll tell you. I use eye drops first thing when I when I wake up. I wake up with burning dry eyes and I <laughs> I because of again my hours and so I use um eye drops. I travel with them. I love them. And yeah, I think that's really it. You know, for a while I did have some rocks. You had tourmaline, mm-hmm. but I had someone gave me this really interestingly shaped chunk of amethyst and I had that on my bed cuz it just looked pretty. Well, it's supposed to be very therapeutic to to have stones. I mean, mm-hmm. someone that was more into it than I am yeah. could tell you about all the different meanings and uses of stones and what they do for your body and how they ground you, you know, to the earth. I've I just read this really interesting article and I want to say a cowboy magazine and I know I'm doing a huge disservice to a magazine that I saw on the Air Canada <laughs> Air Lounge. But it was basically about what has happened to the human body since we stopped sleeping on the ground. Oh. Sleeping on the ground. That You know how they talk about magnetic beds yes. and magnetic bracelets and magnets? And grounding is a big thing, walking on the bare, the ground with your bare feet. Yes. Yeah. So I read this article and I was so, I kind of felt bad. I thought, I haven't slept on planet Earth in like a sleeping bag mm-hmm. since I was 13 or 14 years old. And there is a feeling that you get... And maybe that's why people are such avid campers. They take their kids. They feel this sense of euphoria because they're sleeping on the ground. I mean, they might be on a little one-inch foam mat. But but I am, one of the things that I'm determined to do as I go forward is maybe once every year or every year and a half is take some pals and go on a camping trip and sleep on the ground. The benefits that this guy talked about, like what it did for his anxiety and depression, he said he just bawled his head off. The first night he slept out there, he said, I literally rolled out my old sleeping bag and slept under a tree. Mm -hmm. He said, I was kind of freaked out about bugs at first, and I thought about critters coming to get me. That's me. But it was his parents' property. (laughs) Oh, okay. Somewhere in Saskatchewan. Yep. And he said he cried for the first hour, and then he just fell asleep, and he just woke up. And this is the summer, folks. I'm Mm -hmm. not talking about the dead of winter, but it made me get choked up. Reading, reading it on it. the plane. Oh, okay. We'll see. And so then that's kind of the logic behind maybe having these stones next to you. Yeah. Well, that was, yeah, I was wondering, how did I get onto that? But, <laughs> but just things to do with the earth. I mean, we're all, a lot of people live in high rises. They live in condos where they're way far away from yeah. the ground. Yeah, and that's, and that's me too, right? And I, my thing was that I used to collect rocks when I was a kid. 
So there's the Ontario Science Center, and they have a gift shop. And on the way out of the gift shop, and I love the we Science Center. We are looking for a sponsor. We are. Hello, Ontario Science Center. So I used to stop there on the way out, and I would every time I went, I would get one or two rocks. And they were... Oh, it's the best. It was the best, and I had a full collection. I don't know how nerdy it is of, of me to have a rock collection, but I loved it. And uh, anyway, so it was the kind of thing where when I was given this by my friend, I thought, yeah, I, I kind of like this. I'm going to put it next to me at bed. It reminds me of being a kid. And then I, ha- I also have a book. And I always have a book or a stack of books uh, next to the bed because I like to read before bed if I if it's I can. The only thing that really gets me to sleep, and uh, that and the Calm app, I have to say, speaking mm. of sponsors, but I love any of those apps that are on there that it, they basically tell you bedtime stories. Mm-hmm. So it is the equivalent of having someone reading to you. Honestly, Caitlin, I have never made it past like 10 minutes of any of those reading stories. <clears throat> and I do fall asleep because it gets me off of the wheel of repeating thoughts. Yes. And I know you guys out there can so relate to this because we're all human. We all have, and they seem like banal tasks that we are going over and over mm-hmm. in our minds. So don't feel alone in that. But honestly, if this this app, this Calm app, and I, it, it is a charge, but I know there's things on YouTube that you could click on to. Um, ASMR. Well, when we've talked about that before yeah, on the have. show. Um, but yeah, it, it just... Anything routine, I think, is a really good thing to get yourself into. The Calm app is great. And on YouTube, too, they have these um, people who will give you a guided body scan. And it's a body scan. I bet they do. <laughs> they do. They, do. They, do a, they come to your house? <laughs> not an X-rated one. Because I would pay for that. <laughs> but a body scan for sleep. And it's really relaxing, too. So if you ever look up that on YouTube, if you have difficulty sleeping, it can help you kind of like refocus on relaxing. Oh. The book I'm reading is actually called um, You Were Born for This. And it's by an author called Chani Nicholas, who I would love to have on the podcast at some point point but she's a great author are and you she, out there are you out there she is she is out there and uh, she talks a lot about astrology she does people's birth charts but it's it's more than that it's deeper than that it's therapeutic so i'm gonna have to you know what jan i want to do i want to find out your exact birth time and your location and then on one episode we're gonna do your chart i would really be afraid of that okay well maybe, I, we'll wait I, we'll I, make I'd you like more to... comfortable with the idea and then we'll talk about it in okay next break. all right um yes we were just talking about me giving you my date of birth, which is March 27th, mm-hmm. 1962. My time of birth, I believe, was very in the morning between like 5 and 7 a.m. Mm-hmm. I could, I, everyone that knew me at that time is probably not on the planet anymore, so I would have a hard time. Maybe it's on a birth certificate, my time of birth. Did yes. they write that stuff down? They do on a long-form birth certificate, okay. or at, if the hospital that you were born in is still around. And I, it's been leveled. It was it's the General leveled. Hospital in Calgary, and it is now gone. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. But but I know that it was very early in the morning. Like I wonder if that would help her at all. So I never I never really paid any mind to your star signs. You know, your your what's your sign? Like okay. I, I'm a Sagittarius. I never really cared about that. And then all my friends started using these two apps, and they're astrology apps. It's called CoStar <laughs> and it's called The Pattern. And I thought I'll just do. It Is for it fun. one app or two apps? Two apps. One's called CoStar okay. and the other one's called The Pattern. Okay. And they both do deep dives on your birth chart. And what I didn't realize is that you have your you have your regular old s- sun sign, and that's the one we're most familiar with. But then then you also have a moon sign and a rising sign and together it's supposed to put together your whole personality and the more in depth you go the more personal it is the more uncanny but don't starts. you think your brain kind of goes yeah that's me like it's it's you 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 it's wishful thinking you want to it believe is. it some of it for sure is and some of it's generalized and i'm i i mean i hope there isn't a scientist listening right now going oh what a load of crap um but really <laughs> there's a lot of scientists that listen to us <laughs> you know zaya is probably listening right now being like caitlin um but really what happened was it was the darker stuff the stuff that i wouldn't want to be true that started going wow were you with me like what give me an example so i mean a lot of it was just about about the the nature of your journey and for me it was like you know you're about my I guess my unconventional outlook on life and the struggles that you have with trying to conform to one rule for society now that probably resonates with a lot of people but they get really in depth on it and then they talk about um, the emotion you know your emotional side the emotional side that you probably show to nobody who you are when you were at home alone that's your moon and no one thinks about that and so there's there are these things which look at if you're not into it I don't blame you and you could be listening to me rightfully and thinking I'm, I'm full of crap. But when I got... I don't think you're full of crap at all. I, I believe in everything. And when I got these apps, they just started They just started to know so stuff. So is it something daily that is updated yeah. daily? So for the day that you're in? Yep. 
You get okay. a little outlook for your Don't day. Don't wear blue. <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. It'll just tell you what's going okay. on in the universe and how Repeat you might feel. Repeat the apps one more time. In so case. we've got we've got CoStar, and okay. the real one that I love is the pattern. And so when the I pattern. when I started write that down. And I'm gonna. I'm writing it down right now. Again, people at the pattern. Hello, yeah. we're here for you. Yeah. Um, but so, really, what happened was I then discovered this. Uh, she's a celebrity astrologist. Her name is Chani Nicholas, and she has this great book. And she talks all about. It's kind. Of, it's very therapeutic stuff. And and she talks about the power of feeling understood. And uh, she's wonderful. And she's been through a lot. She's kind of an activist. And so there's an activism bent to her work. And uh, I love it. It's called You Were Born for This, and it really. I I enjoy it. And then now, I'm gonna read it. And now I love doing other people birth charts with them. It's a fun thing. <laughs> okay. And everyone loves talking. You could do a party. There's there's book clubs, but then you could do your birth chart. I have been saying this to my girlfriends that I want us to do this. And on uh, the radio station I work at, I work at Chum Radio, and a huge portion of our announcers are all Sagittarius. And Isn't that weird? It is weird. Is Mara Sag? Marilyn is Marilyn a cancer. Dennis. She's a cancer. She's cancer. Marilyn's a cancer, but, you know, um, Meredith Shaw, Shannon Burns, Ashley Greco, Richie Favalero, and myself, which is a, most of our announcing are staff. Are Sagittarius. All Sagittarius. So I just said, hey, let's let's do a, an astrology party. Like, we should have a, we should have someone come and do all our birth charts. Everybody was into it. It's just, it's just fun. Um, but I think that it seems like there is a this renewed desire in younger people right now for astrology. And I don't know what hole it's filling in people's souls. Well, I think because religion is so waning. Religion is in such a strained, precarious position mm-hmm. in human life. And I'm not saying this is any different than it was 2,000 years ago. Religion was very strained. 5,000 years ago when, you know, there was dozens of gods, when mm-hmm. there was a god for everything. When you look back at, at uh, you know, the, the Greek mythology, Roman mythology, mm-hmm. before Christianity, these were precarious times. When you look at... Um, you know, Eastern Asian, you know, philosophies, yeah. whether it's uh, Sri Lankan or Indian, um, they had dozens, dozens of gods. Well, they still do. So I think people are looking for something that's a little more accessible as far as almost factual. Like when you look at a birth chart or mm-hmm. when you look at, at numerology or when you were born, there's something, people are looking for something specific to them. Yeah. That's a more personal kind of a religion. Um, and I get all that. It's, it's hard to have faith in, in times like these. It is. And I, I think when you lose faith in some of our systems, you know, be that political or economical, um, you know, if, if capitalism isn't fulfilling you, you're not alone. Yeah. And so I think that what ends up happening is they turn to other they turn to other things. And for right now, astrology seems to be one of them. And uh, and it, it, it's in a new kind of modern, fresher way. It's not it's not the usual, like, what's your sign, baby? It's, Were your parents it's, religious? Uh, no. Oh, well, actually, sorry, I shouldn't say that. My dad is to a degree. My uh. grandparents, his parents parents were very very religious. What, what was their Catholic? Okay, so they were, right. they were super Catholic. Um, I found that they had a really nice, um, ca- like Catholic bent on it. They were very, very charitable, and uh, they really focused on doing things for other people. I mean, uh, my grandfather was a politician on Prince Edward Island, and his focus was helping people who were poor, helping people who were disadvantaged, helping people who had physical disabilities. That wow. was very important to him, um, and and also so then like taking that attitude to the home probably would have been my grandmother. So they did a lot of great work there. Um, but you know, it, it falls apart a little bit when you look at the church as a whole. And so well, my you're... dad lost track of it. It, it, just, it just didn't resonate with him. So I didn't grow up religious really. But in, in, in organized religion, whatever, Catholicism, uh, what, whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, I, I don't always want to give them a bad rap because they're all kind of in the same boat <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Yep. But the whole idea of punishment and reward mm-hmm. that you have... This ideology that's based on if you are good, you are rewarded. And if you are bad, you are going to be punished. And we are all seeing that not to be true. Uh, We look at people leading the world and we look at these terrible guys. um, And you're you're like, how does this happen? Where is God in all of this? How does someone like that get ahead? And I think when I finally realized that as an adult person that I said it to myself... And it took a long time. Mm-hmm. And it's not based on this. If you're doing good things because you think you're going to get rewarded for it, then that is a moot point because it you cannot do things expecting to be patted on the back or or to be, you know, or to be thwarted. It just none of that exists. Anyway, we're gonna come back. We're gonna talk to somebody who uh 
is going to shed a lot of light on on business and and being a person in business. Denise Donlin is with me today, and uh, you won't want to miss this. Once again, back by popular demand, Denise Donlin. We had such a great conversation last week um, about a lot of things, but I'm just going to jump in and can kind of continue where we were. We've been talking about women in business, in positions of leadership, and how Denise even started to navigate that. She was one of the only people running, well, she was the only person running a major label uh, when she took over at Sony. So you were working with Celine Dion back in the day. I was. And she was just, she was still on that climb into the stratosphere of fame, right? Yeah, well, she'd just taken, when I joined Sony, which was um, right at the beginning of the global crash, right? It was like, hi, welcome to the company. Yay. The honeymoon's over. Um, but Celine had been on a hiatus because Renee had been sick. And so the first time I actually went down to talk to them, and I knew Celine in a very peripheral way, right? From Through much the music, music channel, yeah. Yeah. But uh, And he uh, explained to me what she was going to do in Vegas, right? And I still have the placemat that he drew the game plan, like a football plan, about what he was going to do. It was and, very Cirque um, du Soleil back in the it, day. What, well, that was what inspired the okay. whole Vegas residency. But, you know, they pushed that into the stratosphere with that, you know, huge show. And so many artists since that. I mean, she literally... She started that whole thing. She started the whole thing. And what she did for Vegas, she was a one woman economic machine right uh, like millions and hundreds of millions of dollars of people the tourists that came in to see Celine and now you know Elton and Mariah and, and so many Shania they're doing residencies in uh, and it's great because she you know she toured That's all right. over the she world did. she started all started. of it and and Renee's vision to it too um but yeah it, it it revolutionized the way because at the end of the day when you're that level of an artist an artist icon you don't want to be running around the world and uh you know performing everywhere she, they built uh, something where that artists from all, or fans from all over the world came to them. So she had Renee Charles. What a great first, concept. Yeah. How many of us is, would aspire to be in one spot and have the fans come to you? Well, and it was also a family thing too, right? She could do the show and go home and, and play with the babies and uh, and be a mom. So it worked for her. So they flew you down there, obviously, when you took over the presidency to talk strategy and, yeah. you know, what was next for Celine. Yeah, yeah. That um, was hilarious. I mean, the, I, I'm, the first time I got to Vegas, I'm standing in the line trying to check into the hotel, and they're going, oh, no, that's, there's no reservation. And suddenly I'm behind a velvet rope, and, and I get this suite that Renee had, had uh, booked for me, and I walked up with my little carry-on, and into the room there were seven full-size bathrooms, there was a nanny quarters, there was a did, butler quarters. Did you quarters. pull in all of them, Denise? Uh, I, I stole all the full-size Deveda products from oh, seven bathrooms. Yeah. But really, and the valet comes in and he says, would you like me to uh, to hang your clothes and prepare them? And I'm like... I'm, I got this jacket. That's what I said. Thank you. I said, I'm pretty sure I can put on my jacket without <laughs> injuring myself. <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, it was a whole different world from what I was used to, penny-pinching at Much Music, to going into the stratosphere of, of, of these legendary artists. People don't probably even think about this, but you also walked into, never mind a global crash, but the music industry was changing because streaming started. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before that, we all went out, we bought our CDs, we bought our albums, and now we're entering to a place where Napster um, was kind of scaring the hell out of everybody. Because well, people was, were downloading yeah. music digitally. It took yeah. a long time. It did, but you know, by the time I got there, Napster... Uh, well, he was a two-year-old. He was, a, and he was a disruptive little Dickens, that Napster. Because you're right, people wouldn't go out and buy the new Pearl Jam record. They'd buy a a blank CD uh, for a you know fifty cents and download the record. So the industry globally crashed, right. and artists got le- uh, dropped, and so literally billions got of laid dollars off. went away. Really? Billions of okay. dollars, and it took twenty years for the industry to recover. And it has recovered in some sense, but uh, there's uh, still a huge value gap for artists. And the artists are not getting paid the way they need to be to be able to support their career. I mean, the one percenters are. You know, Drake is fine, um, but the the middle piece. Like when you're when you're streaming a five hundred million 
times on a single song. You are being monetized for that. You are, but but the scale is different. Like in 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 the old days, no, Jen, no, I, you hey, remember? I'm right, I'm right yeah, with yeah. You. you could write a hit song and make enough money from traditional media royalties to you know put a down payment on your house to buy your yep. first house. Right, one hit single can buy you a house. Yeah. And let me give you a comparative. And these numbers have probably changed, um, but. Feral, remember that big hit, yes. Feral, Happy, right? Yeah. He made that's a huge song. Here's what he made in three months: forty-three million streams of Happy. He made twenty-seven hundred U.S. dollars. Like it's shocking. So that so has to be fixed. Just so for the folks at home, when you think, you know, all oh, they're all music artists are millionaires. It's no. just simply not the truth. It's not the truth. You know, yeah. most people are really most artists, and there's thousands and thousands of us are trying. They're paying mortgages. Mm-hmm. They're out on the road pounding the pavement because yeah. the live, you know, monies that they make is probably the only income stream that they really rely on. True. Because I don't stream 47 million times. <laughs> I think you know. Sometimes I look at stats. I'll I'll look at insensitive, for example, on YouTube, and I'll see that it's been watched. Like one million times, mm-hmm. which is nothing. They watch a cat gouging out its owner's eyes 20 million times, right? <laughs> and they're making so money from I, that. I, I can't even keep up with that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, it, it takes a long time to monetize from the streaming side of things. So you have to keep working live. Yeah, and that's a bit of a perfect stream too, you know, because the live venues across the country that used to be downtown and the urbanization that's happening, the rents are too high, so the bars are closing, so there's less and less places to perform live. Um, and it's difficult, you know, when you're an established artist, but what if you're a new up-and-coming artist, right? All this democratization, the, the supposed golden age of, of music where you could reach out and have a global market when cut out the middle person or the middle record company. But what happened was in order to get signed now, you have to have a huge audience already, which means you're not only writing the song and managing yourself and marketing and distributing yeah, it yourself. Yeah, you're your own promoter. You're your own promoter. And the social media piece, I mean, you're awesome at social media because you, well, Jen, you're a sharer, and we love that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but shut up! <laughs> no, no. Shut up about the horses. Oh, but, yeah. you know, they're expected to build their own audience yeah. before they even get the attention of a, of a label or a, or a strong management company, which means they're they want, on Twitter. They want an audience built in already. Exactly. Yeah. They're on Twitter five times a day, and for me, I think it hurts the art, because if you're expecting your artist to do all of that work, I want my artists to put their 10,000 hours into crafting their music. It makes them hustlers. We talked a little bit on the break the last time that you were in, and you were really talking about how going forward you really want to see, or would uh, what, what really interests you is the development of young artists mm-hmm. and young people going forward. How do, you, how do you even start to curate that? Like, how do you help people navigate that because I get asked it all the time Denise and I don't even know what to tell them yeah. and yeah you keep working hard keep doing your demos but they want to know where what they do yeah yeah I mean it's still you can still break through right yeah. Justin Bieber broke through the uh, Billie Eilish woof like her and her brother still living at her mom's house creating that huge is she really record like 17 18 yeah is she's really that young oh she's a you have to watch the James Corden with her in the car it's unbelievable you will fall in love with her deeply but uh but she's a true artist right and now she has of course a support structure to help carry her to the next level very grounded um the one thing i will say about that and we we touched in one of our conversations about how highly sexualized young women mm. still continue to be in music with Billie eilish and the yeah. kind of success that she's had you with know she's big baggy she, sweaters yeah yeah she's yeah. in pants she's covered from head to toe mm-hmm. i really love that I really love the fact that who she's presenting is, and is their age appropriate? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Is it? But she's showing, and young girls are emulating that. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. And it's not about, again, it's not about the dressing and the sexualization piece. It's about being true to who your your authentic self is, and then trying to find a way in this highly sexualized business to actually lead with your authenticity and your art. It's the hardest thing ever. But if you can do it, it means a long career, yeah. right? Rather than this flash in the pan, overproduced, great hit, bye bye. Yeah. It it leads to longevity and a legacy. You are listening to the Jan Arden podcast. I'm talking to my friend Denise Donlin, who 
was instrumental in my life, absolutely. You put me on a live and interactive. When I really wasn't one of the cool kids, you took a big chance yeah, on me right. at Much Music, but awesome. I wasn't. I had a few, I had a couple of singles under my belt, and but I wasn't, I never felt fashionable or anything like that. But you were And you're authentic. like, I don't know if we're going to do the numbers, but I'm putting you on, and you yeah. did pretty good with me. Well, you did pretty good for you. I mean, you know, your songs, the songs you were, that came out, like, you, I, 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 I empathized with you. I could feel you just through your music. And that was the wonderful thing about, you know, being in a position of, of relative power is you could look around and go, you know what? I can champion this person. I can, I can, I think this is the person that needs a leg up, that needs a, a helping hand. And that is so gratifying. I mean, I've been applauding you from the first day I oh, ever I know, heard I know you. you have. I've, totally applauding I've you. I've always felt it. I, I felt like I absolutely had such a great support system in you. And like I said, you know, looking up to you and, and being somewhat intimidated and, Just a um, goof with the title, honey. No intimidation. But there. I mean, <laughs> but, but we, people don't look know that outwardly. We really, mm. I would have no idea that you would have had any kind of doubt or second guess yourself. Mm. I I know these segments go by so fast, so I want to jump into this book that you've written. Uh, Fearless came out in two, 2016. Yeah, November. And it is it is. I don't even. How do you go about starting a book? Why did you feel like it was important? to get this story down, because I really think it is a battle cry for women, and how you fought your way through a very male-dominated in- industry. Well, it be, it started because, you know, the publisher asked me to write a book, and I thought they wanted, you know, bold-faced celebrity stories, and there are bold-faced celebrity stories in there, but at the end of the day, it's like, ugh, who cares about what I think? You didn't want to be a gossip book. I didn't, oh God, there's enough of that. There's. I didn't yeah. want to throw mud. But, but you can understand I, why they'd want to do that. Well, for sure. Because you did have the inside track on some pretty debacle I did. type days. And that, that book was well lawyered, let me tell you. But <laughs> at the end of the day, I wanted to write something that I thought might be inspiring for young women and that talked about the Canadian cultural industries during a time of, of great power and great change. Huge um, change. Yeah, and just, and just try to be honest about it. I, I wanted to write something that had to do with, with feminism and, and not had about, about how to get power, but how to wield your power, how to be... And it, for me, you know, this world needs more kindness. So for a while when I was writing the book, I wrote kindness, 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 just to remind myself all the time when you do want to go down those paths and like rake the dirt. And then it ended up, the, uh, I took that off after it was written and uh, and wrote Faster, Funnier, Donlin, <laughs> because I was the queen what are these of lists. On, are they on post-it notes, like <laughs> yeah. in front of your computer? Totally. Classic. I can show it to you now. I still have Faster, Funnier, Donlin. But yeah, no, they asked me to write, and the and I said, well, I don't know how to write a book. I know how to write a PowerPoint. And, uh, the publisher but you're a very said, gifted orator, and I found that the way you wrote this book, I could hear you talking to me. With every paragraph. Oh, well, that's high praise. Thank no, you. But, it, but that's the authenticity. I think that's why it was very easy to read. As much as it was, you know, the, the people that you've met through the years and, and the names and the, the events, I can't believe that you recalled the stuff. Like that your well, memory... I always kept a journal. You and Keith Richards, I swear to God. I always think, <laughs> how does he remember a goddamn thing he wrote in his memoir? And I felt, not that you Especially were... Especially Keith. I know, and you weren't drunk and stoned the entire no. time, but... This is a lofty book. It's a lot of well, to recall. Well, I always kept a journal. I mean, it wasn't a I feel like this today, but it was who I called, what the project was. I have all of that. And <sighs> and so I referred to it. And I just started writing. And they wanted 250 pages. They got a little bit more than 250 well, pages. Well, I wrote 1,200 pages. And then I handed Jesus. it in. And because I gave it to the editor and and I said, uh, did she fall off of her she desk? She fell off her off her off her desk. And then she she'd send me back these notes like, I strongly suggest you delete this entire chapter, or I strongly suggest you rewrite this entire chapter. And I thought. But I thought I was going to hand you everything, and you would turn okay, it into magic. Give me magic. an example of what they didn't want you to write about. You have to. You you can't tease me like that. Like you, uh, it can be a general thing. So a whole chapter on what that she wanted you to delete. Oh, a lot of it was was stuff that was in the weeds, regulatory okay. stuff, right? The Canadian cultural industry stuff. Um, she wanted it to be more personal, and that was harder for me to write. But um, I think you. I think you did write a very personal book. I think you made yourself very vulnerable, mm. but it was also very. It was factual. It was it was 
you know, it it has those textbook qualities as well that are like, this is what happened at this meeting, and this is mm. what I walked into, and 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 this is what I was up against. Right. You know, you and but you still had a sense of your family, your personal life, like what yeah. you endured as a young woman. Yeah. Well, it, it is a memoir, right? So yeah. it does, you know, when I was two, it does start like that. Yeah, I love it. Um, it's got to start there, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, you have to write about your vulnerabilities. And if it's going to be about feminism and humanitarianism, the things that, that I think drove me the whole time uh, with my little imposter syndrome, just trying to prove myself, damn it. Um, I don't know that, I find it so hard to believe yeah. with that. I'm just, I'm so grateful for your honesty with that because it just... You've never struck me as that person that had any of that going on. Well, <laughs> I guess we all do. Fooled, fooled you again. That's what the imposter syndrome will always say. But I think, you know, it's like artists. I have the greatest respect for artists, the greatest respect for you. And partly it's because the business is yin, yin and yang, right? Yeah. You, in order to create, to be authentic, you have to have a very thin skin. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be open to the muse. And yet, to be able to market yourself in this business, you have to have reptilian skin, right? For the slings and arrows, for the social media, for the red carpet. Oh my God, she looks awful in that dress, right? So I think the life of an artist is very, very difficult. And unless you have a team around you that can help ground you, it's how can you be on stage singing to 20,000 people and then go home alone in your room and then try to come to grips with who you actually are? That, I think, is the most difficult thing ever. And for artists that can manage that and and travel that road and still be here to tell the tale and being, you know, embarked embarking on on new adventures like you are like your 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 television show well, your I'm not books. afraid to suck like I really <laughs> am not and <laughs> that's important and you and I and I want to <laughs> ask you this because I talk about this a lot on the show you as women of a certain age mm-hmm. you know that we go to their 50s and 60s I feel like you know I'm going to be 58 years old I feel like the crone coming out of the trees and I'm so grateful for her <laughs> do you feel like the time that you have spent in your own skin has been such a wonderful reward to how you now go through the world and how you're able to, if you're not beside me, get out of my way kind of a thing? Yeah, I'm still not, if you're not beside me, get out of my way kind of thing because I really am, you know, yeah, try to be more, I try to lead with empathy where I can. But yeah, the whole, you know, once you hit 50, you're going to be that confident. I woke up when I would turn 50 and walked into the bathroom, turned the light on and looked and went, okay, today's the day I'm going to feel confident. <laughs> and all I was like, shit, I need to get my eyes done. It was, oh, Denise! <laughs> it didn't happen, but I'm getting there. You look yeah. <laughs> so amazing. Like, you're one of those timeless well, people. Well, I did have my eyes done. I couldn't see anymore. But I, I, I had, my, my friend's husband just had his eyes done. Mm. And, the, and the Alberta government paid for it because oh. it was actually a medical thing. He couldn't see. Me too. I'd be watching TV holding my <laughs> eyebrows up because the flaps of skin were holding my eyes Well, down. it was so great. But that, I paid that for it, it myself. Yeah. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> but I can see you. You look awesome. But I, I um, well, people always ask me this or that. And you know me, I've been so many different weights in my career. I mean, I'm 60 pounds less than I was like eight or nine years ago. And I, I've whatever the case may be, I have never relied in my career Mm. on my visual appearance. I would like to think that you and I both have been the type of people that have kind of relied on our integrity, our intelligence, Mm -hmm. our wit. You are a gifted orator. I have heard you do speeches that have made me cry. I I watched you do a speech last year, and I was side stage. Oh, was that at the the Juno Awards? Yeah. Thank you for introducing me that night. Thank you. Denise, I was standing there with Anne, which I do your, it's, this is kind of an inside, but our friend Anne that works in the TV industry, and I was just bawling my head oh, off. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you. I think. I'm no, sorry. <laughs> no, absolutely, because it was funny. It was, you were acerbic, and I think you were looking out at a crowd of people that you have probably come to blows with a few times. Mm-hmm. Those were friends and foes and foes that became friends. How do you do that? You've been through so many 
You've been so many different versions of yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I think it does. And I think you, you know, basically you go through life and you you build experience and you build, it's kind of like putting more tools in your tool belt as you go forward, right? And, you know, as I said earlier, I really do, I have a, I have a challenge with power because I've seen so much abuse of it, especially yeah. as I've traveled in conflict zones and, and see what happens to women and children. Um, so for me, that night was really about how can I use this opportunity to hopefully lift women up? So I challenged the men to stand up in support of women. I know. Right? And they all stood up. My mom, she's 92. She was watching live stream because that's how she rolls. Yeah. She goes, darling, you've got a standing ovation. And I'm like, well, I made them stand up. <laughs> Doesn't and, uh, matter. You know, and then the girls stood up. But there were women that came the next day and said, you know, thank you. You made me cry. There it's were also true. some guys who came over the next day and said, so I stood up. Up, and then I got really nervous, yeah. and I thought, "What the hell is you going to make me do now?" And I'm like, "Just be an ally, be a co-conspirator." Yeah, we all benefit when women have uh, more equal opportunity. And I, well, that that really was such a uh, an amazing moment for me when you when there was kind of a call to arms. That's what it felt like to me, and mm. that really made me cry harder because that was kind of coming over the hill of what you'd been speaking to, and I was surprised. I found it really bold and really vulnerable once again i think for for not only women in general but for people to make themselves vulnerable mm. and i think that's been part of your success story denise is that you have worn your heart on your sleeve and you're like you know what i f up mm -hmm. i'm not always going to get yep. this right absolutely but i'm going to support you when you f up mm -hmm. um final words once again here we find ourselves um just in in your life going forward, what what are kind of hopes and dreams? We're living in crazy damn times. Oh, what, and I'm not going to say what's your five year plan, Denise. But <laughs> what what are what are the some of the stuff that turn you on that make you want to get out of bed every day? Well, it's still you know I, I I endeavor to use my whatever power for good. Right at the end of the day, I still I volunteer. I'm on five nonprofit boards. I Jesus. I still go to conflict zones with a camera and try and be a voice. Look up for, War Child, people. Yeah. War Child. Look it up. I just got uh, last year was in you know the Middle East looking at their work with Syrian refugees there so for me you know having an opportunity to help in some small way even capturing someone else's story is uh, I think it's the secret of life just be your most human self this is the Jan Arden podcast I've been talking to the incredible Denise Donlin her book fearless as possible under the circumstances, is available. You can get it online, Amazon. You can get it in bookstores. I highly recommend reading it. It's inspiring. It's authentic. And uh, one of the great female voices of our country, Denise Donlin, I hope you'll come back. Oh, I, this was such, such a delight and such an honor for me. Thanks, Jen. Thank it's great you. to see you. You're looking awesome, by Thank the way. Thank you. Yeah. We look goddamn fantastic, yeah. people. You should see us. <laughs> we have taut stomachs. Listen, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Tootly-doo.